Welcome to the MS Dev Show, episode number 132. This week, we talk with James Clark about the visual layer in Windows. Microsoft Build 2017 is in cloudy Seattle. You are not paid to write code. In Photoshop on ARM. This episode of the MS Dev Show is brought to you by Aspose, the market leader of .NET and Java APIs for file business formats. Natively work with DocX, XSLX, PPT, PDF, MSG, MPP, image formats, and many more. This week we have James Clark, Principal Program Manager on the Composition team, which builds the rendering, effects, and animation system for Windows, including the Desktop Window Manager. He's been with Microsoft for 10 years, and in his spare time, he builds Bringcast, a UWP podcatcher for Windows. He's also a closet Casey Neistat fan and wannabe boosted board owner. How's it going, James? Really good, thanks, guys. <laughs> I won't be using a boosted board in today's weather in Redmond. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and I know I know you reached out a while ago um, asking to, to try it out, um, so I don't know. We'll have to, like you said, though, we could do it in a, in a parking garage, I guess. Yes. Um, so we still, we still got to figure out when, when we're going to do that. Um, but it's not like you're going to buy one right now anyway. I would wait till summer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I won't, I won't be out there on that for sure. Yeah. But I, I will give you uh, I'll let you, I'll let you try it out. Awesome. Maybe we can find a secret bunker and go and try it in there. <laughs> yeah. Well, we do have the, the commons parking lot is what it's, I think the, isn't it like the largest underground parking structure in the United States? I think it actually is, yes. So it seems pretty adequate. That actually, actually the boosted board would be amazing for that because you could park real far away and just cruise around. Oh, yeah. Anyway, we should probably talk tech. <laughs> so how's it going, Carl? <laughs> it's going pretty good. <laughs> so what do we have for the comment of the week? So comment of the week, uh, we got it from Captain Grumpy on Twitter. Nice uh, name. Uh, he's thanking Aspose for supporting uh, one of his favorite podcasts, and uh, that's because this is the first episode where uh, we've uh, switched sponsors. It's now Aspose, so uh, if you hear a little bit of different ad in the middle and at the beginning, people are like, uh, "Yes, you can think." <laughs> you can thank <laughs> them. Different, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know there's a few people who could recite the previous ones by heart. So. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that comment. And uh, yeah, so the um, yeah, we're really thankful for um, for Aspose. We are looking for uh, a second sponsor to to come in as well. We're we're talking to a couple of different people, so now's your now's your chance to get in. But we really thank them. Um, and then we are working with them to figure out what we're going to do for giveaways. So definitely keep sending in your comments for for a chance to win. Um, we're going to we're figuring out what we want to give away. I'd like to give away like all of their stuff at different times. So we're, we're still working on that though. Yeah. But if you want to get mentioned on the show, send us an email to feedback at msdevshow.com, comment on Facebook, YouTube, or Stitcher. And we really like those five-star iTunes reviews. Perfect. Okay. Let's jump into the news. So the biggest, biggest, biggest news item here, build 2017 details announced. Yeah. So it's actually going to be pretty, uh, close to both of you this yes. year it's going to be in seattle uh, <laughs> may 10th through the 12th yeah i've been so I yeah and i don't know if i've mentioned on the podcast but i've always wanted to be in seattle I, it always i don't know it just seemed kind of wrong going to uh to san francisco i think it i think it should be in seattle this is our home turf um most people travel in for it anyway so it's um i don't know hotels are I guess they're probably going to be as expensive with that many people coming in, but we have great facilities here. And I think Seattle is an amazing city. So I'm super excited about this. And one of the things I'm really hoping for because of this is that uh, more people can attend in, in the past. Uh, they've pretty much maxed out from my understanding, the Moscone center where they've been having it as well as, um, you know, just being, having a bigger facility in, uh, in the Seattle area. So uh, really looking forward to that. Really looking forward to maybe being able to eat the food there at at lunchtime. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Hopefully they can work. And maybe out. and maybe they won't sell out in one or two minutes. Maybe it'll be open for a half hour. <laughs> you never know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't hold my breath on that one. People are pretty excited to go to these things. Um, and then what else is in here? Because I see there's like announcements around Envision and uh, Worldwide Partner Conference. 
Yeah, so the uh, Worldwide Partner Conference is renamed to Microsoft Inspire, and that will be held in Washington, D.C., uh, July 9th through the 13th, as well as um, Microsoft Envision, uh, which is um, previously held in February, but now it'll be a part of Microsoft Ignite in September, the end of September. So if you're looking for one of those other conferences as well, because they all have a slightly different bent, developers, partners, as well as business leaders, uh, kind of three different uh, uh, vent target audiences for those. Uh, mm-hmm. Those are the big uh, events that Microsoft will be holding throughout the year. Yeah, but I would say probably anybody listening to this show, you know, who's a developer, Build is the event for you, and that's the one that we'll be at. Uh, we'll be yes, there both of us way. will be there. Yep. All three of us will be there. Oh, excellent. You'll <laughs> actually have information. Last, last you year, you were on the Channel absorbing. 9 stage, weren't you, James? I did. I got to do a little. My, my boss was actually, I think, on sabbatical. So I got to actually go on the Channel 9 stage and uh, stand in for him. So that was fun. <laughs> okay. Uh, so what else we got here, Carl? You are not paid to write code. Yeah. And uh, they, they kind of make this comparison uh, between coding and Taco Bell, whereas Taco Bell really only has a very limited set of ingredients. And they just kind of recombine them in different ways to get their entire menu. And saying, you know, as developers, you know, we hit different APIs. We shouldn't be coming up with new ways to sort strings or or to do anything, really. We should be kind of doing the minimal possible. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, adding the, the business value writing. and solving problems, right? That's, that's what we're here for. Yeah, and uh, to kind of back that up, I also found a really old uh, article by Joel Spolsky going back to 2000. Wow. Where are saying, like, one of the worst things that you can do is rewrite existing code. Mm-hmm. And he gives kind of a business case where it kind of put Netscape out of business. And he, he gave a few other ones as well, uh, where uh, Microsoft even was looking at rewriting Word, and uh, it had cost them a lot of money. And luckily... Uh, when they scrapped it, they had been co-developing on their old code, ba- code base. But just because code is old doesn't mean that it's bad. Right. Uh, it's yeah, been tested. The, yeah, it's You've tested. worked the bugs out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and unless you can like, I mean, really, I think the, the bar is like, can I make this an order of magnitude better? And not better from like a, well, I guess it is better from a coding perspective. Is there is there something that is dramatically going to make it so that I could use, you know, maybe a 10th of the code or something like that. Because again, you know, going back to your original statement, you're not paid to write code. So if the tools have dramatically changed, I mean, one thing I can think of in my career is uh, in .NET, I was doing a lot of uh, charting uh, back in like starting when .NET was in beta and there weren't charting controls or the ones that were out there were really bad and they didn't have a lot of, I mean, it was like a pie chart and a line chart and those types of things. But I was doing some really complicated charts and I had to write all of that from scratch, like literally like I was drawing that using like system dot drawing. Um, and that was just a ton of work. Now that I could I could see a justification for because I can literally take, you know, 10,000 lines of code, 30,000 lines of code, whatever it is. I can throw that all away and I can bring in, you know, 10 lines of code to do the exact same thing. But uh, yeah, it's about delivering business value in the simplest, most maintainable uh, way possible. So now tell me, Carl, about the code that uh, this guy is still ashamed of. Yeah, so uh, th- there's this article that uh, it was uh, one of his first jobs out of school. Mm-hmm. And he had was writing this um, software, a website, uh, to kind of promote this drug for a pharmaceutical company. Mm-hmm. And in, in the end, you know, it kind of, no matter what happened, there was a quiz that whatever answers you picked, as long as you didn't say I'm allergic to the product or I'm already using it, yeah. it would recommend that product. You know, it's <laughs> kind of like how we imagine marketing forums really all are. Right. And um, in the end, you know, he was told that he did a great job or whatever, but he found out that like some of the side effects for this drug were like severe depression and suicidal thoughts. And he had heard about a case where somebody using this drug had killed themselves. And it really kind of took the steam out of like what he thought was a, was a good job. Yeah. And it even got to the point where uh, a relative of his was recommended this drug. Oh, and man. he kind of after hearing all that, he said, yeah, you shouldn't really use that. And he's still kind of embarrassed that he's attached to that kind of a project. 
So, you know, this article kind of had a, a link baity title. It's not really the code that he's ashamed of, but the association to what that code did. Yeah. Well, he wrote and, the code, right? It was the means to the end. It was the means to the end. And, you know, you know, I, I think that a lot of us are lucky enough to not be in those situations, but it really kind of thinking. brings up the, the ethics of what code can accomplish and do. Yeah. No, that's a good point. Like I, I've been lucky to write code like for good. Um, you know, that, that just, it's for doing things that I think are, are good in the world, but you, yeah, I mean, there's, there's so many people out there just writing like bad things. And I mean, I feel really bad, right. Cause you, you, you know, you finish college and it's like, Oh, Hey, we have this job opportunity. And you're like, you know, you don't know better. It's like, Oh, that pays well. And all this other stuff. And they're like, we want you to write this thing. And then you come to find out that it's actually pretty horrible what you're doing. Um, well, I don't know. There's other, there's a lot of work out there. If you're, if you're doing stuff like this today, Start looking for another job, please. <laughs> but somebody's always going to be doing it too. I wouldn't use it as a justification to keep that job, but that's the unfortunate side effect. Okay, so Carl, I I need to I need to, a good regex for doing um, email address validation. Do you have one for me? Well, I, I have one for you, and it's only six thousand three hundred forty-three <laughs> characters long. Yeah, this is a really really old oldie but goodie. Yeah, I, uh, I've seen it before. I think you sh showed this to me a few years ago, but it kind of yeah. is making the rounds again. And it just kind of shows you that sometimes, even though you can do something with a technology, maybe you shouldn't. Um, yeah. Uh, so they even say in here that as big and as long as and as complicated as this is, and you should really check this out. If you're into regex, um, <laughs> you're still going to shake your head at this. Um, that it still doesn't cover all of the edge cases. Yeah. Um, so the th things that are worthless. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to me, a lot of times it's easier to, do they have, you know, a character, a dot, a, you know, or a, yeah, a an character, an at sign, yeah. a character, a dot and a character that to me for most of what, you know, business deeds I see yeah. that covers an email address. You got to yeah. have that at sign. Exactly. Uh, but yeah, it, check this out. And if you, if you really want, uh, Try it. I haven't. Uh, tell us how well it works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, I think this was a, an answer I had to something because somebody had come to me and they're like, Oh, I'm looking for a regex for, for email validation. I'm like, don't do that. But if you want to, here's a regex for it. <laughs> and I think it, I think it makes people think twice about using that. Um, okay. Balancing user friendliness and developer convenience and edge developer tools. So what are they doing there? So as developers, we're really familiar in a website. You just right click and you see the inspect mm -hmm. uh, element uh, in, in Edge and Chrome and Firefox and all, all the browsers. They have these tools uh, that make our lives easier. But the problem is, uh, especially uh, since Microsoft is doing the putting the tooling to find out you know, how people are using um, all the different things, they, they find out that there's a lot of people out there, specifically non-developers, that are really confused by some of these tools. So what they're uh, doing is they're actually, when the first time that you try to use it, and if it can tell that, hey, you didn't really mean to use it, it's actually going to hide that menu for, from you from now on. So that way, uh, you know, your non-technical relatives, when they see, you know, they're not going to see that, they're not going to be confused, and they can just see their copy, print, you know, all of the normal things that they would want to use a browser for. I never even thought of that. Like is even yeah, Chrome and, and edge you right click and yeah, there's inspect right there. And I never thought like 99% of the people that use these browsers, they have no idea what that is or what that means. I mean, they, if, and if it happens, they're just like, it's probably, they probably thinking like what, who just abducted me and took me to this other planet. Yeah, and especially since like if you do that right click on the bottom of the page, it's at the bottom of the menu. That's like the first thing that's closest to your mouse. Right. <laughs> so from a UX perspective, it's going to get hit on accident yeah. probably a, a good percentage of the time. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. See, that's why you have telemetry. Oh, uh, what else we got here? WinHack. What's going on? At WinHack. What the heck is that? WinHack. <laughs> That is the uh, the hardware conference that Microsoft holds every year in China, and this year. Um, I you know I didn't watch the the news like I have a few of the other events recently, mm -hmm. but there was some pretty big announcements came out of there. Uh, the first one is that Hololens is going to be uh, for sale in China pretty soon, which is a huge market for that. So there's going to be a lot more people having access to that technology. 
And they uh, gave a little bit more details on Project Evo or what they announced previously to be their the third-party uh, holographic devices. Mm-hmm. So um, Asus, Lenovo, uh, Dell, a few of those, they're going to be having those devices with the creator's update. And uh, there's a bunch of minimum specs that uh, if you're interested in that kind of things, um, uh, you can check the show notes and uh, that will be in there. Yeah, I've just been waiting. Uh, I've been waiting to use all of this tech, right? Like I, I know there's like the Oculus Rift and there's some other options. And I've just been patiently waiting for this to, to sort of wor- work through this cycle and figure out, you know, what we're going to use this for, what it's great at. How do we get it for a reasonable price? Those types of things. So I think we're, I think it's another step on that journey. So it'll be interesting to see, see what happens there, especially with these, with these really smart OEMs there that, that might come up with some interesting things. So I'm patiently awaiting that. Yeah. And the last one, which was still a little bit vague, but is really, really exciting is windows on arm. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, yeah, that's pretty Microsoft sim- pretty has for. Yeah, if, you, if you've paid attention to how Microsoft has worded, especially a lot of their conversations around mobile and phone, they've really talked about uh, cellular-enabled uh, computing devices. You know, they haven't called them phones or anything like that. And, you know, I think this is kind of another, another you know, evolution of, you know, what their Microsoft is preparing to tell us about this. So mm-hmm. um, with Windows running on ARM, that means that, all the classic uh, applications will run on ARM through emulation um, without really even being recompiled, which is which is pretty huge because that means developers don't have to do anything. Their existing uh, binaries will just work. Yep. Yeah. So that, I mean, that was always the biggest limitation with um, um, with the, like the Surface RT, and then and and, and actually, I, I had to I had a lot of conversations around that because. I even had tell, people tell me like, no, no, you can run anything you want on there. And it's like, no, it, it doesn't work that way. Unfortunately, <laughs> it has to be, you know, compiled for, for ARM. Um, and obviously in the UWP world, you know, things are all are all great, but it's all these legacy applications. So on a device like a Surface RT or or on a phone, I mean, you have that, that, R, that very power efficient ARM processor. Um, this is pretty cool because they, there's a video in there that shows basically like a 2016 era um, you know, like this year era Snapdragon processor, and they actually show, uh, you know, opening a graphic in Power or in um, uh, Photoshop, and then actually like applying some some operations to it. And it's really cool that that's a possibility because you could have, um, you know, then a, a phone that's emulating x86 that's running something like Photoshop. So, um, yeah, any any technology that that we can have like this because I think. People are wondering if Apple's going to do something similar, but any technology where you can, you can switch to this new processor technology, but but still bring along all those legacy applications makes it much more much more viable. Um, so yeah, this is this is, I think this is still pretty pretty far out, I, and I have no insider information. I'm not going to ask James to to comment on it at all. <laughs> but I'm just uh, this is this is cool. I mean, flexibility um you know opens up possibility so i guess i'll just wait and see and, and i'm sure there's going. going to be some restrictions uh i mean it's been a, a long dream of many developers to run visual studio on a pretty low power device so yeah you know it you know i think that's going to be you know one of the bellwethers you know can can you run visual studio on on a phone in yeah. continuum mode i mean that would be amazing yeah. right exactly because it's it's not even, you know, like whenever you're doing that type of thing, you know, you already have your mail client and you have, you know, the stuff built into Windows, but it's always like that one killer app, you know, and maybe it is like Chrome or, or maybe it's the uh, the desktop version of Outlook or something. Um, actually, for me, that's probably what it is. It's probably <laughs> um, because, right, if I'm using Windows phone, right, that you don't get the desktop version of Outlook, right? You get the, there's a UWP Correct. version. Yeah. So like having like the desktop version, like they had on the, on the surface RT, um, um, would be pretty major, uh, being able to run that. That would be, stuff. especially if it can handle the kind of rules that you have to filter out all the mail. you guys. <laughs> get well, I definitely couldn't update my rules. Uh, it would take a couple hours, but the, um, luckily most of those rules run on the server, but you're, you're absolutely right. I, I push Outlook pretty hard. 
Oh. Yeah, there was a funny story about that video, actually. I, I, uh, my daughter was playing in a concert at school, and I'd just driven up, and I was about to walk in, and I, I kind of glanced at my phone, and I saw this <laughs> news story, and it's like, we what? <laughs> and there was this amazing, as, as you, you mentioned, Jason, amazing YouTube video, yeah. and it's like, holy moly, that's, that's Photoshop. And yeah. It's, yeah, it's, it's pretty exciting. I think, I think the other thing that actually resonated with me about that announcement was just talking a little bit about, you know, Qualcomm has got some great chipsets that have integrated cellular, and so... You know, they talked about the notion of, you know, you can have kind of laptops with great battery life because of mm -hmm. ARM, but also that have the cellular stack and that are always connected. And so so then you get to kind of run Outlook and run all those rules wherever you are, Jason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's kind of nice, too. I mean, just having just having options, because it's hard to say, you know, in a year from now, like, where is Intel going to be at as far as power consumption? And then where is ARM going to be is in terms of performance? Because it's. Intel hasn't done the greatest job at, at lowering their, their power usage. ARM has done a really good job of like making these processors crazy fast. Um, I don't know if you have an iPhone. Well, you no, you wouldn't have an iPhone. You'd have a Windows phone. But uh, <laughs> I, have a, I have an iPhone 7. And this thing, the processor in this thing is just ridiculously fast. Um, I mean, it's beating like desktop machines at JavaScript benchmarks. And that's using, you know, a quad core ARM processor. And really, it's only using two of the, the, the four cores. So I can only imagine like four of these faster cores on there. Um, they, these, they just keep getting faster and faster. So, um, I mean, we, we, we always have to expect that computing performance will keep going up. And, and then we just need to think about what kind of possibilities that, that opens up. So I'm, I'm just really excited for a future where, yeah, the, the software is at, at that point would just be independent of the processor architecture. Um, and now we, and we have processors of all different types that can be put into any size device and any configuration. Um, and we're to the point now too, where it's hard to differentiate between like tablet phone and desktop because they, there's a device in, in, in all of those shoulders that sort of blur together. Um, you know, kind of the, and, the, the brunch of devices. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's one of the nice things actually about the UWP platform is that, you know, we already have support for, you know, the different architectures and the single yeah. package. And so to some extent, you know, we're sort of anticipating that that transition where, you know, yeah, you just exactly. build a single package and it, you kind of want it to run everywhere. Yeah, because, you know, it, it's funny because we, we tend to take this approach like, oh, you know, um, you can build your desktop app and thanks to the, being UWP now it works on all these on all these other things. Um, but, you know, part of it, too, is like, I think you were kind of alluding to this is just this uncertainty about what is going to be popular five years from now. And we almost we sort of have to you sort of have to hedge your bets from an application perspective and say, you know, it's kind of like when responsive designs are becoming popular. You know, it was just accepting the fact that, you know what, we don't know what size screen you have. I remember, you know, you used to write software. It's like, well, most of our users have 1024 by 768. Some have 1280. <laughs> You know, so we'll basically optimize for like those two sizes. And then and then people are like, you know what? There's so many sizes out there and people have these giant curved displays that are like this tall, but they're three feet wide. And um, so I think we just kind of said, you know, I'm done. Like, let's just let's just assume that anything and everything will exist. And let's just make our lives easier and figure out how to program against everything. And um, I think UWP is a, is a great way to do that because, yeah, you write one application. You're like, you know, we'll just... We'll figure it out later as as things come out. We'll 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 make the change of the application the easiest thing to do, and uh, we'll we'll just you know uh, make our development time as as easy as possible. In that yeah, way, I mean you know I, I I guess another example is Surface Studio. You know that that's a that's a pretty pretty big screen, and so yeah. if you want to have UI that adapts and exactly. you know works great on it, you know it's it's you're going from a tiny screen to actually pretty pretty big screen. So yeah yeah. 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 And then, you know, I don't know if you want to run on the Apple Touch Bar, you know, that thing is super <laughs> awesome. I don't know. You know, it's funny. Cause, I mean, there, who knows? Like, I, it, you could have devices with crazy aspect ratios in, in, in very niche situations. And having something that just handles that is great. And then having something that can do things like animations and those types of things on that is great as well. So why don't we talk about that? <laughs> so, um, you know, we're, we're, you're on the composition team. Um, I don't really even know what, I, I know like the, the definition of composition for the most part, but like <laughs> what, what is composition in this, in this context? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's actually quite a confusing term, which is I think easy, easy yeah. to get confused about. And, and it really, the genesis of, of sort of the notion of composition goes back to, you know, Windows XP, where at that time, Win32 desktop applications essentially just 
when, when they wanted to sort of draw some graphics, they would literally just draw them directly into the frame buffer on the screen. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty, pretty okay until an app ha would hang and you would then sort of be dragging the window and your desktop would be essentially getting erased because the app, the UI thread was hung and everything. So in, in the Windows Vista timeframe, we, we, no we introduced this notion of a composed desktop and having like a sort of a global window manager, DWM, as, as it was, as it still is known. And so we've got this sort of big, this, this sort of big powerful graphics engine and, and really, you know, the way we've started to evolve how we think about composition is we really, we really think about it now more as something we refer to as the visual layer. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, the audience is very familiar with the UI layer and, you know, the today in Windows, that's kind of XAML. Um, it could be UI kit uh, in iOS land. And, and people are also very familiar with sort of the graphics layer, and that's typically OpenGL or DirectX. And so we, we think about this thing in the middle, which which we call the visual layer. And this is really where the rendering happens, animation and effects. And we can really have this optimized um, place where we do all of that very efficiently. Um, and then that can be leveraged from 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 the layers above us. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if, for, for developers familiar with iOS, you can think of it as, as sort of an, an analogy to, analogous to, core animation, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because applications today are, are, I mean, you were talking about like the XP days and I mean, Apple, we, we're just so much more demanding now from our from our applications. Like we, we want yeah. it to be smooth. We want it to look cool. We want it to make sense. Yeah, well, I mean, the bar's really gone up and actually yeah. the kind of the mission that our team set, I mean, I, we were actually coming up for our three year, three year anniversary, um, the team in its current formation. And we we're just looking back over sort of some of the changes we've done over the last three years. And you know, really our mission all along has been to enable beautiful apps and beautiful experiences on Windows. And we want that to just sort of be the default so that when you, as a developer, come along to the platform, want to build an app, you really have this this, this great canvas to really allow you to express your idea in just a very visually appealing and, and engaging way that really will grab uh, end users. And so we've sort of come quite a long way on the journey. We've got a lot, a lot further to go, but uh, it's pretty interesting to just look back over the history of how things have come. Yeah, I love that charter. That's really cool. Yeah. So, you know, you, you said composition does encompass a lot of things, but uh, whenever you see like the first, like getting started with composition, you see a lot of, you know, animation kind of things. So what specific things does uh, uh, your team cover? Well, um, we really, we sort of provide all of the rendering and animation services for Windows. So the good news is we've really spent a lot of time plumbing that throughout the system. And what that means is if you do file new project and create a XAML app, um, uh, as of as of very recently, XAML is now actually calling directly into our public uh, Windows UI composition API service. There was actually a thing in the in one of the recent flights that called this out. Um, and so, really, you know, by just doing a new project in XAML and using the the default kind of capabilities that are built into XAML, you're automatically kind of leveraging and using the power of the composition engine. Uh, similarly, in, in a web project, if you do something like a CSS3 animation or transition, you know, part of the web standard, um, you know, CSS grammar, you're again getting getting our engine for free. Okay. And so what, uh, so, you know, the, the idea is that we want it to be the substrate upon which these things are built on. And similarly, if you go in and use Cortana and you see the nice new Cortana experience with a nice blurred background, again, that's all leveraging the composition engine. But what we wanted to do in addition to sort of plumbing the frameworks directly on top was also to provide a, an API surface to allow you to kind of go further. And, and you know, if, if some of the behaviors and storyboard animations you get in XAML uh, aren't enough, we want to give you this, this sort of ability to sort of drop down to the next layer in the stack without having to go all the way down to DX. Because, you know, I mean, if you guys have ever had to write DX code, you'll know that there's a lot of code that, that you need to bootstrap mm -hmm. yourself. And we wanted to really kind of provide a much, a, a much still a still a rich API surface, but a, but a much more concise ability to do these things like animations and effects. Okay, I, I like that concept of you know I'm getting all this stuff for for free because it's it's really part of the the stack, and then I can I can extend it. That's I mean that's the way I always want these things to be structured. Yeah, so, the other benefit of that, sorry, yeah. just one more point on this yeah. is, you know, the, the fact that it is a common layer in the system, you know, we've done a lot of work to optimize it across the different form factors. So, you know, if you take your UWP app and put it on an Xbox and you want to get these animations, like I, I recently, I don't know if you guys have played with a Twitter experience on the Xbox, but they've actually done uh, some, some, some really great integration with, with some of our, our new effects. 
Um, and it's literally just the same code base running really well on an Xbox and also on these other device form factors. So there's a real benefit from having this layer in the system where we, we kind of write stuff once and we really optimize it well. Okay. So for the, for the APIs, what kind of benefits do I get over the, over the old technologies and classic apps? Well, you know, what, one of the areas that we've really invested a lot in is in the notion of sort of not just animation, but also interaction. And that's where, you know, you think of a typical animation is there's, there's a, you know, a series of keyframes and it executes over mm -hmm. time. But increasingly, you know, with touch and with some of these new input forms, you actually want the animation to be tied to and driven to input. So whether you're on a precision touchpad, whether you're on a touch screen, you know, maybe you want to get like a parallax or a sticky header where, you know, you kind of you're scrolling the page and some elements are kind of like snapping up to the top of the page and those kind of things. And so, you know, there's some really some quite good and unique features that we've added in terms of input driven animations and also in terms of effects. You know, we've we've really, you know, tried to, to build a, a very optimized real time effects engine. So if you want to do something like a blur, it isn't just, well, I'm going to blur the screen. It's actually, well, I want to do an animation and maybe have that be driven by input. So, so those are sort of some of the, some of the things that, that you can see. Um, I'll maybe use this as an opportunity just to sort of um, do an advert for our, um, our, our sort of sample gallery. We have this fairly extensive mm -hmm. um, repo on GitHub where we've got about 30-ish samples and there's some really great examples. So for anyone that kind of hasn't seen or, or isn't really aware of what some of these APIs can do, it's it's a very easy way of just seeing some of the capabilities and things like, you know, sort of a little bit of physics, a little bit of effects, a little bit of, you know, input driven animations, those kind of things. Yeah. You know what'd be great on there? And I sorry for putting you on the spot and like making more work from you. But I you know, <laughs> I went out there and and I had um I mean you have to like pull down the Visual Studio code and and but it's it's great that you have all the samples out there. Um, and maybe you have this somewhere, but um, it'd be great to have some some animated images out there that kind of show like each of those. Because um, I think there's like a picture in the one repo, but it, it really didn't tell the whole story. I think that'd be a great way to see like what the options are. Or, or is there a page like that already exists? <laughs> That's actually a really good, uh, a really good idea. And and what we do, what we have been doing is is actually sort of tweeting out quite a lot about, you know, as we add new samples, yeah. putting little animated gifs. Okay. The other thing that we're sort of looking at doing is, is actually putting our sample into the app store so that you can just install it. Yep, and that was go my play. other thing too. Because I actually I uh -huh. went out to the app store to see if it was in there already because I just wanted to pull it down and, and play around with the animations. <laughs> yes, I know it's 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 something that we're we're working hard okay. on. A guy on my team is actually doing this this right now as we speak and so okay, i'm hoping good. uh pretty soon we'll we'll have that but okay. I, I do like the idea of actually putting some animated gifs into into the web page so you can see yep. them sure. yeah i just have no attention span and that would be like instant gratification for me that's great <laughs> <laughs> i suppose offers a powerful set of file management apis with which developers can create applications which can create open, edit, and save the majority of popular business file formats. Their product range supports a multitude of file formats, including Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, PowerPoint presentations, PDF documents, OneNote, Outlook, Project, Visio files, popular image formats, and many others. Aspose produces APIs for .NET, Java, and the cloud, which can be utilized in almost any modern language available today. Visit www.aspose.com for a free 30-day no limitations trial. And if you get stuck, message the friendly support team for help. All technical support is offered free of charge. Remember, if you're a lucky winner, you will receive a free developer small business license for Aspose.Words for .NET a powerful toolkit to work with Word documents in your application. About a month ago, James, we had met in person and you, I, I think you had told me you had heard on some podcast that uh, somebody made a comment that composition is hard. <laughs> yes. um, do, do these uh, uh, demos, you know, prove or disprove that really? Because I, I know some of the original code samples on MSDN really didn't kind of make it look like it was something that would be easily addable to an application. Yeah, and, and it's sort of somewhat of a relative term. And, you know, I think, um, you know, the way I think of it is, is if we're not enabling something in one line of code or one line of XAML, then it's kind of hard. Like if I need to actually kind of go and build up some objects and set a bunch of stuff up, mm -hmm. uh, that that is not as easy as it could be. I think the second thing is, you know, obviously one of the great and powerful benefits of XAML is to have a markup driven approach. And so I think, you know, those are, those are really two areas where we, we want to sort of double down and, in, and invest. So, so I think 
it, it, you know, in terms of is it hard, you know, one of the, the, the demos that I, I like to do was around parallax and just show how in about five-ish lines of code, you could build an amazing kind of parallax experience that's driven by input. It works great with, the scr you know, the um, scroll bar with mouse touch and so on. And so that's an example where, you know, if you want to try and build parallax without the visual layer, you'll find that it's actually probably quite a lot more than five lines of code. Um, uh, you know, so that that's an example where I think we're making it easier. There are obviously other examples, and if you look in the sample gallery, there are some pretty extensive examples where we're doing things like lighting and, you know, setting up light sources and shining them around and so on. And 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 for those, there's definitely you know more code than we would like today. So, you know, the the, the things that there's some there's some good stuff happening. You know, like the um, UWP community toolkit guys. You know, like I know you had them on. Mm -hmm. They've actually, uh, you know also being helped by the community, done a great job at adding some nice helpers where, you know, they've got this really nice fluid UI for adding effects and animations. And so as a stopgap uh, in the short term, there's there's some sort of ways of, of, of making it a little bit easier and more approachable through those terms. It's also something that's part of our charter, like we want to make this easy and by default. And so in terms of looking forward and, you know, like obviously we've talked about the um, the Windows 10 creators update, you know, this is definitely something where you'll start to see us um, try to kind of um, improve the ease of use and blur the, the boundary a little bit between kind of the UI layer and XAML and the visual layer. Um, I can talk a little bit more about that later on yeah. if, if you'd like me to go into it. Well, one of the things that I like that you mentioned that, you know, it's not that necessarily that composition today is is hard or difficult. It's just maybe a lot of unfamiliarity that's not something that developers pass on this knowledge of composition to other devs like they do on how to connect to a database, how to do certain kind of web requests. Those are things that are a little bit more that happen more often, especially in an enterprise setting. So just taking the time to educate yourself is really a little bit more of the quote difficult part. Yeah, that's, that's a, that really, really good point that, you know, familiarity and education and just, I think working through, you know, some of the samples and just kind of wrapping your head around some of the, you know, the concepts, you know, things like I need to get the backing visual for this button so that I can apply an effect to it. And, you know, once you've done that a couple of times, it actually doesn't feel that unnatural. Um, mm -hmm. And it's something that will make a lot easier. You know, I think, you know, one of the things we want to do is is actually sort of make some of our effects and, and those kinds of things work just like XAML brushes do. And so um, there's actually something that we're working on called a XAML composition brush um, that will allow you to essentially take an effect graph that might be doing a little bit of blurring, a little bit of lighting, and actually just apply that any place that you could apply a brush in XAML today. And so that's where you'll actually be able to put effects into markup. You'll be able to put them in resource dictionaries and styles, all the things that are familiar to XAML devs and make it much easier and more reusable, um, you know, things that we're definitely thinking about and working on. That's pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. So and, you know, another thing that I think when people look at composition for the first time that do have a little bit more experience in XAML is they try to compare it to storyboards. How, how do they really compare and when should you use one over the other? Well, that that's a great question. We do get that quite a lot. And, and actually, um, it, it's, it's quite a, an interesting thing to examine. So, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, storyboards are actually powered by composition animations under the covers. And so if you put a storyboard in markup, you use blend, however you want to do it, you've, you're actually getting access to composition under, under the covers. So that's kind of good. So obviously some of the things that storyboards excel at today is, is you've got a markup representation of them and that's that means that it's kind of easy to tweak the values it's easy to add blendability which means you can obviously take tooling like blend and have that that play into the picture um, i think some of the places where our kind of animation system comes in uh into its own one is scalability so um if if you want to do something like declare an animation and then apply it to lots of elements like you know maybe you've got 500 or, or 1000 elements pictures that you want to apply the same animation we we actually have um a much a much more efficient way of essentially setting up and and kicking off animations that you get you get benefit so there's a little bit more cost up front to sort of go okay I need to do this in code but there's actually a great benefit in terms of kind of performance and scale um, some of the other areas where I think, you know, you might want to consider composition animations, um, made a list of these earlier, but um, input animations is one. So if you're trying to do kind of parallax, we talked about those kind of things, 
then you'll absolutely, I think, want to look at our animations and our kind of expression system that makes those much easier to do than with with storyboards. Um, the other thing is 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 layout animations. And actually, I was really happy. I don't know if you guys saw this come out this week. Um, VLC actually just you know popular video playback application just updated their UWP. I think it's now version 2.2. Um, and they actually one of the first apps that I've seen take advantage of layout animations for 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 resizing scenarios. Yeah. Um, Ooh, what was the app you mentioned? Uh, it's called VLC. VLC. Oh, VLC. All yeah. oh, the the one that's in the Windows Store. Yes. Okay, I'll yes. take a look at that. Yeah, so they just did a, an, an update, and they're actually using a whole bunch of our effects and other things. But, but as I say, layout animations is actually something that we think is a really big opportunity for just bringing some of these delightful experiences to bear. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I'll actually talk a little bit more about that in a minute. There's there's something I, I want to mention that okay. we're working, which I'm excited <laughs> to tell you about. But, um, you know, those are some examples. Uh, you know, another obvious example is if you're trying to do an effect like kind of a blur, like maybe you're trying to do the notion of a dialogue or something where you want the rest of the UI yep. to be visible, but just de-emphasized or whatever. You know, blur is a great way of doing that. And, and obviously making that blur animate in and out is just makes it feel more fluid and delightful. And so if you're looking at actually building kind of effects and having those animate, then again, that's that's another another case. Okay. So, I mean, that's really sort of how I would think about things today. It's definitely an area of focus going forward is is how do we actually kind of integrate together and actually have, you know, you know, the ability to, to, to kind of essentially declare uh, composition animations in markup and actually kind of rationalize those with storyboards. So in the long term, we're going to take care of it. In the short term, there's definitely some fairly clear reasons why you'd use each one. Okay. And then is there anything I have to know ahead of time? I mean, do I have to understand? You mentioned the, um, you know, the, the, the visual underneath the control. And then there's there's obviously the whole visual tree. Like, do I just jump in and start using this? or Or do I have to kind of read up on some of these other things first? Um, I think you don't necessarily need a working knowledge of the visual tree and, and kind of it depends whether you want to sort of use existing effects that, that we provide in some form, either through our, our various toolkits or samples, or whether you actually want to author them yourself. You know, like if you want to actually author custom uh, effects, then there are things you can read up on like blend modes and and, and actually Win2D is a great thing to to dabble in a little bit just to get an understanding just for some of those concepts. We We share... We share effects descriptions with Win2D, and so if you want to do something like a desaturation or an arithmetic composite, those kind of image processing style of effects, we share those with Win2D. So, it, you know, as I say, if you're authoring, I'd recommend that. If you're consuming, really, I think there isn't a lot you need to to, to pick up up front. It's I think just take a look at some of the the samples, and that will really guide you and kind of show you what's important. Is, is kind of what I recommend. Okay. So is composition the apis are they uwp only so yeah i mean in in, in terms of you know when i think about the visual air uh, visual the visual air i think of as the programming surface for for the the system compositor and we have win32 apis that we that we that we essentially developed back in windows 8 that we refer to as direct composition so you, you can think of direct x or direct 3d <laughs> direct 2d um so we have that family of apis called uh uh, direct composition, and then in the UWB, at UWP space, we we have the the sort of Windows UI composition star namespace, and that, as I say, we sort of refer to collectively as the Visual Air APIs. Um, today, those are only callable from a UWP. Um, there are there are obviously some APIs that exist in the in the UWP namespaces that you can call from Win32. Um, today, our APIs do not fall into that set that you can call this is something we're actively working on and there are some kind of plumbing reasons why that is the case today there's there's some kind of things like call dispatcher and call window dependencies that you can only really get to from um from uwps we're working on trying to fix that so we definitely so you're love saying, to hear so you're sorry. saying that in the future it could be possible to run this on either a classic app outright or maybe through project centennial Yes, we're, we're definitely, I'm not, I'm not sort of saying that in any given release we'll yeah. have it ready, but you know, it's something we're working on. Will it be this month? No. Over time, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Will it be tomorrow? Um, probably not tomorrow. But, um, you know, we definitely want to kind of not have artificial restrictions. And at the moment, as I say, the restrictions we have are really for technical reasons. And we're, we're working on 
you know, fixing those technical reasons so that, you know, at some point in the future, we can consider opening it up because we really have added a lot of APIs over the course of the last few years. There's really a lot more capability now that, that we've added through the, the, the UWP namespace for sure. Okay. Um, anything else you want to mention? I know you were talking earlier. There were a couple of things you said you were in it. Yeah. Maybe you talk about later. Yeah. So, I mean, I've talked about engaging apps and, mm -hmm. and just sort of like creating beautiful experiences. And the other, the other, big area that my team owns um, is sort of some of the aspects around um, things like high DPI and windows. Um, and, and we think of high DPI sort of fitting into a category of, of sort of fit and finish and craftsmanship that we really want to kind of focus on Absolutely. in windows improving. Um, and so, you know, that the, the, there's really two areas. One is high DPI and we're actually very delighted yesterday that one of the, the features that we've been working on just shipped, which was, um, some good high high DPI improvements around the the sort of uh, management console and Windows, which's been an area of the operating system that that much <laughs> like you know things like RegEdit it hasn't had a lot of investment. I've noticed, and it's yeah. That, you know, there's, it's definitely doesn't work great on on high DPI devices, and so we've just shipped a new form of um, scaling algorithm that can actually do vector-based scaling on on the the MMC and sort of device manager, computer oh, management. Very we're not done, and there's a lot more we're doing with with DPI as well. That that you know things like fixing the size of desktop icons, those kind of things, and these are all just really fit and finish issues that that raise this sort of general polish of how the operating system feels. Um, the other one I wanted to talk about is smooth window resizing, and we talked a little bit just now about you know building nice layout animations um, and so on, and and that's a capability that we're offering through our APIs. However, the, the experience is somewhat marred. I mean, if you if you actually kind of open up Calc today or Calculator and you sort of resize it on the desktop, you'll see that it's it's not the nicest and cleanest of experiences. You know, you can sort of see sort of the background a color, color bar uh, exactly that bleeds through as you're going back yeah. and forth. And again, it's not it's not really a deal breaker in terms of it doesn't have a functional impact on being able to use. No, that's why I don't use Calc. It just horrible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Doodle in the head. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I just well, bring, that's I bring one, it. <laughs> well, that that's one of those things that you know this is you know a problem with all UWP apps have this, but that's not something that users might understand. So a user could be using an application that I wrote, and they might notice that and contact me. And exactly. I think that's the, that, that's oh. that's the bigger problem here is I as an, an independent developer, there's no, nothing I can do to fix this. And exactly. it, by by Microsoft improving it for everyone, they're improving my application in the process. Exactly. So I mean, again, you know, because we're really trying to focus on the small things as well as the big things. You know, that's something we're focusing on, working on. We want to try and really improve that default experience and make it good. And then when taken with layout animations and some of the kind of API investments, really it goes from good to great and really, you know, hopefully delightful at some point. So, you know, I, I guess I wanted to give a shout out to some of the the, the 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 things that we all find painful that aren't necessarily the new kind of, you know, really sexy things, but but still kind of, you know, we care and we really want to put a more more focus on those on those things and really working to improve them. So Okay. Yeah. Any other upcoming features in the visual layer that you can talk about? Or is it all top yeah. secret? Yeah. Well, we, we sort of try to be quite cautious about things because, you know, we like to try and overpromise and, un, uh, sorry, it's the other way around. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> overpromise and which way around is now I'm getting confused. Underpromise, overdeliver. Underpromise and overdeliver. <laughs> you know, making Freudian slips up the wall. Um, so, yes, I, I mean, the things that I can talk about are, are things that, that I'm, I'm fairly confident in that we're going to ship. You know, one of them is um, something that we call virtual surfaces. Um, anyone that remembers Silverlight, Deep Zoom, and, and sort of I think the code name for it was Sea Dragon, where you could build these really nice fluid mm -hmm. kind of panning and zooming experiences. Um, we're bringing a new virtual surface API to Windows, uh, uh, hopefully uh, in the creators update. And that's something that will kind of bring back some of the ability to build some of those nice deep zoom things. Okay. Um, so that's one thing I mentioned the kind of the um, XAML composition brush, just looking at my list, also some enhancements to implicit animations. We want to make, you know, those even more powerful and, th and particularly for sort of page to page transitions. Uh, we, we, we shipped a, a, a thing called uh, connected animations in the last update, which is where you know you go to the photos app and you see your grid of photos. You you 
you click on one of the photos and it zooms you to the photo. So it feels like a kind of a continuous experience across the page navigation. Um, and, and so there's a bunch of enhancements that we're going to make there. So, you know, we're, we're kind of working constantly to improve APIs that we've already shipped and add new capabilities, as well as try and make them easier to use and more accessible to more devs. Um, okay. I think I think those are the main ones um, that, that I was going to mention. Oh, okay. actually, there's one more, which oh, is sure. image loading. Um, so image loading, if, if, you, if, if again, for those that have played around with composition layer and have tried to sort of use images, you'll know that there were various libraries that you needed to install and get, and um, there wasn't a great way of actually loading images. We're doing a feature that will allow that to just be much easier and managed by XAML. So you'll be able to basically get back composition surfaces from XAML that will do all the loading and the policy, the downloading for you, the decoding. Oh, that's very um, nice. And you can then use those images and build your own custom experiences. So, yeah, just a, just a few sneak peeks. Okay, very cool. And then my last Hopefully question. Promising. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are not promises. <laughs> yeah, anytime we're talking engineering, we got to remind people of that. Yeah. Um, and then my last question: uh, How did you take the news about uh, Casey not vlogging anymore? I've been quite gutted. I have to admit, like you know, <laughs> I'm a really avid watcher, and you know, it's crazy because he's sort of, I think, broadly appeals to a much younger dem demographic than me. I'm you know, somewhat an older demographic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to yeah, it's a lot of a lot of kids watching. Uh, but yeah, yeah he, he just he just goes and and does cool stuff. For anybody who who has no idea what we're talking about, it's Casey Neistat on YouTube. He was he has like 5.8 million subscribers. And, and, and he's been all his subscriber count started like skyrocketing recently. And then he just quit vlogging, uh, sold his company to, uh, to beam, even though he could still be vlogging or sold his company beam to CNN. Sorry. That's right. Uh, yeah. So he sold, sold out. Um, I he said vlogging was like too easy. It was really weird. Really weird. I know. Well, I think some of it, the, some of the crazy <laughs> videos he made, like, I don't know if you saw the one where he was, um, he was basically skiing through New York city when it had snowed, yeah. like. Yeah, probably a lot of listeners have heard, I've seen some of those videos, and then the other one was the bike lanes one, where he was like, the, he got a ticket for for uh, not riding in a bike lane. So then he just, then he showed himself riding in a bike lane and continually uh, running into all the things in the bike lane. And in the end, he actually drove his bike into a cop car because the cop car was parked in the bike lane. <laughs> so uh, a lot of people found him through through those types of things. He'll keep making videos like that, but yeah. Uh, I don't know. The guy, I mean, he, the amount of, I mean, he get a million people watching, you know, each episode or a couple million, the amount of money that guy was making off those videos. I mean, it was, he was making so much money that, I mean, he could just, he was just flying around the world, like doing fun stuff and just recording it. Like, man, how, how awesome is that to be able to get paid to do fun stuff? Um, and yeah. That, yeah. And it, it's just like this cycle and you do the fun stuff, you get paid, you get paid. So you do fun stuff and like, wow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're not How paid to that? write code. <laughs> We're paid to go. <laughs> what one we thing. And then we'll, and we'll, and then we'll get off this tangent is, uh, <laughs> I, I was, I, I had watched a different video that he was in and it was funny because it was, uh, man, I can't remember who it was, but it was somebody else who was hanging out with him. And basically, I think this is this is why his life was actually like not as great as what it looked like, because the guy is with him and he's just like, oh, this is how I, I think it was like uh, Roman Atwood. He's like, oh, yeah, this is how I vlog. He just does his normal thing and he vlogs. But then Casey's like in the in the grocery store and he has to be there for like three hours because he's like, oh, I went around this bend with my shopping cart. So I have to put my camera over here. Then I have to go back over here and pretend like I don't know the cameras there. And, <laughs> it, you know, like the guy did not live a normal life because of that. So. Yeah, and how he spent, break. how he actually edited one one every day, the amount of sort of attention yeah, to detail in the edit. Yeah, I know. For hours, for hours. Yeah. Anyway, okay, so Carl, what do we have for the dev tip of the week? So the dev tip of the week, we have to uh, have a thank you to Jason Nguyen. Uh, ever since we did the uh, episode on kind of like learning shortcuts, mm -hmm. he's been uh, compiling a lot on his blog. So you should go check it out. Uh, it's gofightnguyen.com. And we'll have a link to it in the show <laughs> notes because it's not spelled how it sounds. Okay. But this week's is in Visual Studio. Uh, in, instead of, you know, my workflow, if I need to like delete an entire word, I'll do like control shift arrow key and then I'll hit the delete, mm -hmm. but you can just hit control delete and it'll delete the word after your cursor. Or if you hit control backspace, it'll hit delete the word prior to the cursor. That's kind of life changing. Let me try it. 
Mm-hmm. You don't believe it. He's he's got animated oh, gifts to, to prove it. So it's amazing. I'm just messing up the show notes now. <laughs> now it just says you just hit control. <laughs> Keeps getting easier. Now you hit nothing. Oh, okay, that is that's pretty cool. I'll have to remember that one. We'll have to send that one over to Jeremy Foster too. Okay. Uh let's see here, James. Uh, I need you to pick a number between one and four inclusive i will go with four please four would you rather walk in circles through a spinning door a thousand times <laughs> <laughs> oh my god i'm just that would be horrible or hang upside down in elevator for three hours i think i'm gonna have to go with hang upside down in elevator because i get terribly sick and i think if i had to go around in circles I'd if just i just be terribly if Ill. i just move my head back and forth a couple times i get sick i could not walk in circles for a thousand times i used to go that, those that's not as bad rides. as you think do, do you remember those teacup rides on um, yep. on oh. the fairgrounds and oh. i used to just stop, get stop, so sick stop. on those. i can't even think about it <laughs> so i'm hanging upside down please like no, see, i got i i did that the other day i went through one of those doors like two times and like it, it'll start messing it'll start getting motion motion sick i couldn't do it so, but carl what would you pick you'd pick the door I'd pick the door. You'd be like, oh, that's just, I call that Saturday. Okay. So, <laughs> so Carl, pick a the number. Thing is, I, think, I think as a kid, that's like some, you know, something I probably had done. No. Well, maybe, but like, <laughs> like, you know, 50 times is having fun. And then, you know, a hundred <laughs> times or more is work now. So it just changes the whole nature of it. I'll pick number three. Number three. Would you rather always have to wear diapers for the rest of your life? Uh, what I think you do anyway. Um, or all, <laughs> or always have to drink and eat out of a baby bottle. I, I, I think wearing diapers is more discreet than, you know, eating, <laughs> and, eating and drinking. It's eating and drinking. You bend so over that's pretty and it's like, sorry, my diaper showing. <laughs> <laughs> um, although there is convenience in that. You know, I work from home, Jason, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to work for 18 hours straight without getting up. I'm good to go. <laughs> okay, I, I don't know. I don't want to pick either of those. Oh, okay, what do we got next here? Okay, so James, where can people find you? Uh, well, I hang out on, on on Twitter quite a bit, so I'm uh, at Clark Zone. I think I'm also at Clark Zone on GitHub as well. Um I also recommend um, following, uh, and this is where I get it wrong. It's Windows UI is, is the Twitter handle where we we do a lot of tweeting. So like if if you're interested in kind of visuals and effects and 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 nice UI, that's somewhere where we've got a great community and you know we'd love to have you uh, engaging there. So those are two places. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, and it looks like Carl's been collecting a whole bunch of links. So we'll have lots of links to all this stuff in the show notes. Uh, Carl, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Carl Schweitzer. And you can find me at ytechie.com or on Twitter at twitter.com slash ytechie. So, James, thank you so much for coming on here and talking about the Windows visual layer. Uh, it sounds like everybody's going to use it, regardless of whether or not they're going to program against it. <laughs> um, but I hope that uh, I hope that everybody checks it out because it's uh, it's really cool and can really make for a, an awesome app. Well, thanks to both. It's been great to be on. I'm a big fan of your show. So it's sort of like, you know, I, I get really excited to be able to come on your show and, and talk about stuff that I work on. So thank you. 